Say one day it's your lucky day again because you bump into the great man Albert Einstein again. You continue on from the last conversation you guys had on mass energy equivalents and remind him just how much you liked his cool little proof that involved almost high school level physics and basic algebra. At that moment, Einstein tells you something that really gets you excited. He says there's an even cooler proof involving calculus and here's how it goes. It starts off with the fundamental concept of action, normally labeled as S. And action is an integral over time of a very special function called the Lagrangian of the system L. The Lagrangian of a system is its total kinetic energy minus its total potential energy. And the reason we integrate over time is because in the classical limit, time intervals are invariant. But we know that's not the case for more general applications like relativity, where time flows differently for observers in different reference frames. What we need here is a new invariant quantity to integrate over. And we do have that quantity in the form of space-time interval. Say we're in some inertial reference frame S and there's another reference frame S prime moving with uniform velocity V relative to us in the common X X prime direction. This of course makes S prime an inertial reference frame too. We describe events in any reference frame by where they occur and when they occur. The question of where is answered by three spatial coordinates X, Y, and Z. And the question of when is answered by an extra temporal coordinate T as in time, that we measure in meters. How do we measure time in meters? Well, we do that by multiplying the temporal coordinate t by the speed of light c. Now suppose that observers in the reference frame s observe two events labeled as 1 and 2. These events are described or located in space-time by these coordinates. Now the space-time interval between these two events, or the square of the space-time interval delta s squared, is defined as the difference between the squares of the temporal and the spatial distances between the two events. That is, I have c times delta t squared minus delta x squared plus delta y squared plus delta z squared. Or in the form of differentials, I can write this as ds squared being equal to c squared dt squared minus dx squared minus dy squared minus dz squared. That's for the frame s. By the same token, we define ds prime squared in the s prime frame, and we now claim that the two intervals are equal. We can prove their equivalence using the Lorentz transformations, which relate coordinates in the s prime frame to those in the s frame. Notice that y and z are unaffected by the transformations because there is no relative motion along those directions. And here the factor of gamma is something called the relativistic factor and it equals the reciprocal of the square root of 1 minus v squared by c squared. Now take the primed equation and plug in the equations from the Lorentz transformations and after some algebra we indeed get ds prime squared equals ds squared or ds equals d prime making it an invariant quantity among reference frames. Now to define a relativistic version of the action integral that for reference purposes I'm now calling I because S is normally reserved for reference frames. And speaking of reference frames, in our reference frame S we have a particle moving with uniform velocity B. And the particle's trajectory takes it from a point in space-time A to another point in space-time B. And points in space-time are called world points by the way. So point A, world point A is the initial location given by the coordinate ct1 r1 where r1 is the position vector corresponding to the spatial coordinates x1, y1 and z1 and world point B is the final location given by ct2 r2. So out of all possible paths leading from A to B, the particle will choose the path that minimizes the action integral i. But how do we define i relativistically? Well, we do have one invariant quantity to integrate over, and that is the space-time interval ds. So it's logical to define i as being proportional to the space-time interval. So i can be defined, because we're integrating over the path followed by the object, we're defining this as an integral from world point A to world point B of something proportional to the space-time interval and that can be described mathematically in this case as a constant of proportionality alpha ds. Okay, and because alpha is a constant, we can take it outside the integration operator. So we're interested in the integral from a to b of ds. And because we want to minimize i, that places a constraint on the parameter alpha. It's supposed to be positive and we need negative signs. Why on earth is that necessary? 
The need for a negative sign is realized by writing i as an integral over time, but not just any time. I'm talking about an integral over proper time. Proper time is the time interval between events occurring at the same place. For example, consider a particle emitting a burst of radiation, calling that event 1, and after some time, it emits another burst of radiation, call that event 2, all while being at rest. In this case, the differentials of the spatial elements dx, dy, and dz all cancel out to 0 because the particle never moved. And in this case, we have ds squared being equal to c squared times d tau squared, where d tau is the time interval we call proper time, or ds equals c times d tau. Now consider the same two bursts of radiation from the perspective of an observer moving relative to the particle. In this case, the particle is no longer at rest from our perspective, and we see both flashes occurring at different locations. So even though we measure the same value for ds squared, our time and spatial intervals are different, and since dr squared is positive, we have dt being greater than d tau. In other words, the moving clocks in the particle's frame tick slower, something called time dilation. Time intervals in other reference frames are related to proper time by the Lorentz transformations, by which we have dt equals gamma times d tau, or d tau equals dt times the square root of 1 minus v squared by c squared. We can derive these equations quite easily by writing out the Lorentz transform equations like I wrote out earlier, taking differentials and recalling that dx would be zero in the rest frame of the particle. For the case of our moving particle in the reference frame S, Proper time would be measured by clocks in the reference frame attached to the particle itself. Now let's return to the case of the integral from A to B of ds. This can be written as a time integral using the proper time recorded in the rest frame of the object. So we have the integral from A to B of c d tau. And we can expand this in terms of times we record in our frame s as c times the integral from t1 to t2 of dt times 1 minus v squared by c squared. Notice that this thing here in the square root is always less than or equal to 1. So this implies that the integral from a to b of ds is always less than or equal to c times the integral from t1 to t2 of dt, or equivalently, it's less than or equal to c times t2 minus t1, where equality occurs when the velocity of the object is zero. So what all of this means is that the integral here is bounded above and attains a maximum value, but it doesn't attain a minimum value. So the only way to ensure that the action integral is minimized is we invert the entire scenario, and we can invert the scenario using simple negative signs. So we define i as negative alpha times the integral from a to b of ds, where alpha is some positive constant of proportionality that may depend on the mass of the object. And now to work with this integral, again translating this integral into an integral over time, in our reference frame, we have negative alpha times c times the integral from t1 to t2, where the times t1 and t2 are recorded in our frame s, of dt times 1 minus v squared by c squared. Okay, so writing this now as the integral from t1 to t2 of negative alpha c times 1 minus v squared by c squared dt and comparing it with the version of the Lagrangian we know and love, it's the integral from t1 to t2 of the Lagrangian function dt. All of this implies that the relativistic Lagrangian we're looking for is negative alpha c times 1 minus v squared by c squared. We're not exactly done with the Lagrangian just yet because we still have to determine the constant alpha. Okay, so we can make use of the classical limit, that is, b is much, much less than c. In the classical limit, the Lagrangian should contain a term that looks like a kinetic energy. So, Using the binomial expansion, we have negative alpha c times 1 minus v squared by 2c squared, and we ignore higher terms in v squared by c squared. And this can be expanded as negative alpha c plus alpha v squared by 2c. 
And the quadratic term here looks like a kinetic energy. So comparing it with the kinetic energy of the free particle that is half mv squared, we see that the v squared terms cancel out, the half, the one half terms cancel out, and that implies that alpha equals mc. Okay. So finally, we've uncovered the structure of the Lagrangian. The relativistic version of the Lagrangian is negative mc squared times 1 minus v squared by c squared. But are we any closer to deriving Einstein's famous equation? Well, we have this mc squared term, so we're definitely close. And recall that the total energy of a free particle can be expressed as the dot product of its momentum and velocity minus the Lagrangian. And all we need now is to determine the momentum in relativistic form, that is. Well, we do have the relativistic Lagrangian, so that shouldn't be a problem. The ith component of momentum is the partial derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to the ith component of velocity. So that means we're interested in the negative of partial by partial vi of mc squared times 1 minus v squared by c squared. And since m and the speed of light are just constants, so that means on differentiation, you can work out the math, you'd get mvi by 1 minus v squared by c squared. Okay, cool. In other words, the momentum is mv times the relativistic factor. So multiplying this or dot producting it with v means that we have e equal to mv squared divided by 1 minus v squared by c squared in the square root. And we have to subtract from it the Lagrangian. The Lagrangian is negative mc squared times 1 minus v squared by c squared. So we have mv squared plus mc squared times 1 minus v squared by c squared divided by 1 minus v squared by c squared. Okay, cool. So we should get a mc squared term and a minus mv squared term, so they just cancel out nicely. And we have the total energy E of the particle being equal to mc squared divided by 1 minus v squared by c squared, which is exactly what we needed. But wait, is there any way to get rid of the relativistic factor and get what's called the rest energy of the particle? Well, that's easy. All you have to do is take the particle to be at rest. So V equal to zero means that we have E equals MC squared. This was an awesome proof for what's probably the world's most famous equation. And it's extremely cool because it makes use of Lagrangian formalism, which is elegant, it's powerful, it's in this relativistic case, just beautiful. I hope you enjoyed the video. Be sure to like and subscribe. Thank you. See you next time.